Gentlemen, part of life is screwing up. We mess up our relationships. We mess up potential client relationships. We make missteps. We screw people over inadvertently, maybe even deliberately. Uh, but life is full of missteps, miscalculations, uh, looking after our own interests, self-interest, and it's uh, not always as virtuous as we'd like it to be. But often I met with questions about what do we do in those moments when you screw up a relationship or you have an outburst or you yell at somebody or you take something personally that you shouldn't and lash out in an inappropriate way. How do you begin to repair the damage that has been done? Uh, and I think that's a faulty premise. Now, I am going to talk about that question in the spirit in which it's asked and give you today six key things that you can incorporate in your life every single time that you screw, screw up to get yourself not only back on track, but to help reestablish and rebuild the relationship that you may have damaged. Now, guys, before we get to that, I just want to welcome you to the Order of Man podcast. If you are new to what we're doing here, this is a podcast and a movement dedicated to giving you the tools, conversations, and resources you need to thrive as a man. So if there's events, our Iron Council, which is our exclusive brotherhood, is opening up this Friday, actually today, as of the release of this podcast, if you head to orderofman.com slash iron council, you can watch a very short video and learn more about the resources, tools, benefits of joining over 1,000 other highly qualified, successful men, men who are on the path. Uh, we, ha we have entrepreneurs, we have business owners, we have family men, we have clergy, we have politicians, you name it. We've got those men representing uh, and you'll be able to lean on them and learn from them. So check that out today at orderofman.com slash iron council. All right, guys, let's get into this. This was brought to my attention from a recent uh, question that we fielded earlier in the week on Wednesday on our Ask Me Anything when somebody said, how do you repair the damage that has been done? And specifically in the context of, of a relationship with children. Uh, guys, I, this is something I'm familiar with. If you don't know my story, I won't get into all the details right now. I've been very vocal about this in the past, uh, but I went through a divorce uh, obviously, my kids are impacted by by those uh, circumstances, and uh, I've spent a lot of time over the past uh, year and a half now rebuilding those relationships, reestablishing relationships, letting them know that I care about them, that I am involved, that I want to be involved, fighting for my rights as a father to be able to be engaged with my kids, and uh, it's been a worthy battle. Not always easy, not always comfortable, but of course, a worthy battle. And uh, I fielded this question, and the first thing I said earlier in the week is that it's, it's a bit of a faulty premise. You can't repair the damage that has been done. Uh, what's been done has been done. So the first thing that I would give to you as a bonus before I even get into the six points is be very, very careful with your words and your actions, especially, especially when you're in the heat of the moment. It's very easy to lose your cool. Uh, it's very easy to lash out at other people, to say things that you don't mean, that you're going to later regret. It's so easy to do that in a very heated, emotionally driven, emotionally charged discussion or maybe even argument or shouting match. So what I would suggest is when you do feel your blood boiling, when you do feel yourself getting upset, the temperature is ri rising, both literally and figuratively, is just pause the conversation. Pause what's going on. Take a step back. Disengage. Go for a walk. Go take a shower. Go work out. Change the environment. Go engage in a hobby. Call a friend. Have a different type of conversation. Whatever you can do to get yourself out of that environment, not indefinitely, because that's just running and cowering and retreating. We don't do that as men, but it gives us a chance to regroup. And then we can strategize about how we want to approach this conversation. So if things aren't going well with a significant other, rather than letting the argument go on and on and on, and the volume increases, the pace in which you're talking increases, the attitude, the bad attitude that you have, the potential insults, the passive aggressive statements and comments that you might make continue to increase. That's a really good indicator for you to say, hey, you know what, hon? Look, I know this conversation is getting heated right now. I don't want this to go to a place where we're, it, it, it's creating damage. So I'm just going to take a break. Uh, I'm done talking about this right now. I will revisit with you, whether that's later this evening or, or tomorrow once we've had a chance to cool off. But I'm not interested in having this conversation because 
I want to make sure I'm coming at it with a level head. Now, that's going to be really hard if you've never done that before. And it may be hard on her, especially if she's an anxious attachment. She wants to address things immediately. That's how I tend to be. And so if there's issues, it's harder for me to take a, a step back and a pause. But it's so valuable and it's much needed. And if you come back and you have a track record of coming back to the conversation with a level head, with, 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 with a goal that serves everybody, and you have a track record of doing that, then she's going to see that when you do say, hey, I need a pause, she's going to see it as a pause and she'll know that you're going to come back and have a better conversation with her. And that's whether that's romantic or a, or a, a friendship or a professional relationship that works in all of those cases. So be very, very careful. Um, I'm fairly decent with my words. I use my words on a daily basis, as do we all, but I'm a professional communicator. So I can say things that, that hurt, that sting. It's, it's not always pretty, and I have to be very, very cautious of that. So with that said, let's say you've done something, you've said something, maybe it's uh, an acute slip up. Maybe it's a, a track record of you just habitually just botching relationships and arguing and yelling and things like this. What do we do about it? Well, number one, you have to realize you can't undo the past. What's done is done. That's why I said, just don't do it in the first place, but let's assume you've done it. Number one, own the mistake. Just own it. It's so refreshing. How often have you heard somebody say to you, Hey, you know what? I screwed up. I came at this the wrong way. I'm sorry for what I did. I should not have acted like that. I should not have said those things. I should not have done what I did. And I just want you to know that I am genuinely sorry for what I did. I recognize that I was in the wrong uh, or I recognize that what we were upset about had less to do with you and more to do with what I was dealing with. And I see that and I'm sorry. That is a powerful statement because it isn't one that's used too often. And so when somebody actually says that in earnest, the other party is inevitably, naturally going to listen because they're not used to hearing it. They're used to people giving the silent treatment. They're used to people stonewalling, gaslighting, manipulating, yelling back, getting defensive, argumentative, rationalization, justification. That's what other people are used to. In fact, that's what your people are your wife, your kids, your colleagues, your coworkers, your boss, your clients, etc., expect of you. So when you come to them and you say, hey, you know what, hon, last night we got into this argument and it was stupid and it was silly and I was upset about something else and I'm sorry, I approached it wrong. What I should have done was this or how I should have handled it was this or what I should have said was this and I'm very sorry. Now, one thing about apologies is they cannot be contingent upon the other person's response. Let me give an example. You say something that you shouldn't say to your wife. And you're thinking about it later that evening or in the morning and you think, man, I was a real jerk. And so I'm going to uh, apologize just to get on her good graces. That's not a good reason to apologize. Apologizing to make somebody else feel better isn't really the point of an apology. The, the point of an apology is to admit fault. It's not so you can feel better. And we'll talk more about that. But the first stage of this is an apology. It's not to make somebody else feel better about what you did. It's just to admit that you were wrong. So you go to your wife and you say, hey, I'm sorry, hon, about what I said. I shouldn't have said that. And she lashes back out because she's still frustrated about what you said. So she lashes out instead of receiving that apology the way that you would have liked her to receive it. She lashes back out at you and say, well, you know what? Screw you. I'm not sorry because of dot, 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 dot. And you go right back into the conversation or the argument that you had the night before. That's a good indicator that you were not apologizing sincerely. It wasn't in earnest and you weren't doing it for the right reason. A genuine apology has nothing to do with the way the other party receives it. So if I were to go to somebody and say, hey, I'm sorry for what I did, and they didn't respond the way that I would have hoped, that's irrelevant. Because whether they're upset or happy or accept my apology or don't accept my apology, I'm still sorry about the way that I acted. And that's the only thing that I have control over. So in step number one, owning your mistake and apologizing, it's not contingent on what the other party says, does, or how they respond. Number two is now we begin to make amends. 
And the way you make amends is by fixing whatever you did to the degree that you can. Let's say that you committed to your son that you would go play baseball with him. And you got busy at work and you didn't get it done because you were busy and you came home and you didn't have the time and you didn't make the time and he feels less important and you recognize what happened. Or maybe your wife tells you or one of your kids tells you what's going on. And so you come to your son the next morning and you say, hey, bud, I'm sorry. I was busy and I shouldn't have been busy. I should have made time because I committed to doing that. And I am sorry for that mistake. Making amends is how about we go get a game of catch in right now? Or another scenario, maybe you overcharge somebody uh, or there's some sort of financial discrepancy with a professional relationship that you have. The first step is, hey, you know what? I'm sorry. I have this happen quite often, actually. I'll have somebody who leaves the Iron Council, but maybe they don't log out correctly or close their account or close it, cancel it correctly. And they'll reach out and they'll say, hey, I closed my account, but I got billed this month. Okay, so the first thing I do is apologize. Hey, I'm sorry, because I don't want that to happen. I'm not in the business of taking people's money who are not interested in investing it in the way that we have to offer. So my, my apology is genuine. I'm sorry. And we always look for ways to improve our system. So I say, I'm sorry. I, I, I apologize that that was overlooked. Step number two, make amends. Let me go ahead and issue a refund. And I issue that refund immediately. I don't drag my feet. I don't question about like, well, you didn't sign up right. So that's your problem. No, I'm making amends, making it whole to the degree that I can. Now, we can't always do that, especially when it comes to our words. What I said earlier, what's done is done when it comes to our words. But our actions, a lot of the times, you can make up for. You can go play catch with your son. You can issue the refund. You can give people their money back. You can do what you committed to doing. Now, maybe it's late, but you can do. You can fulfill the responsibility. Late is better than never. So you're going to make amends to the degree that you can. So step number one, again, own the mistake, apologize. Step number two is to make amends. Step number three is, I think this is very important. We're going to ask for expectations when it's appropriate. It's not always appropriate, so I throw that disclaimer in there. But if I get into an argument with my girlfriend and we have a knockout drag out fight, whatever. And we haven't, but let's just say that happens. And I come to the table the next morning and I say, you know what? I'm sorry. I acted like a complete fool last night. I was frustrated about something at work and I lashed out and took it out on you. I'm very sorry about that. Um, you know, and you try to make the amends to the degree that you can, you explain what happened and, and you don't make any justification for it. You just explain it. And so you say, I'm sorry. Okay. So now where does this come into play with the expectations? Well, what I would say in this case is in the future, it always starts with that statement in the future. So in this scenario, I would say in the future, when I'm stressed out about work, I'm going to commit to you to compartmentalize that. I'm not going to say I'm never going to be stressed. Of course I am, but I'm not going to use you as the outlet for my stress. Is there anything that you would like to tell me to make sure that I show up in a way that is helpful for this relationship. And she might say, yeah, I don't appreciate you saying this or you doing this one thing. There's certain gestures that people do that I know bother people. I have gestures that people do when I'm in a debate, like rolling eyes, for example, is one. Like, I don't appreciate when I'm trying to have a conversation with somebody, even if it's, you know, contentious or confrontational and they roll their eyes. I don't like that. So if, if I'm having a conversation with somebody I care about and they care about me, an expectation of mine would be, hey, you know, I really have a hard time when you roll your eyes. That, that is a complete lack of respect and I don't appreciate that. So in the future, let's have a discussion, but please don't roll your eyes at me or don't, don't do the like, whatever. Like that's another one that drives me crazy because that's dismissive. I don't, I don't appreciate that. I don't respond well to that. So right now what we're doing is we're managing expectations and we don't need to be contentious about it. We don't need to argue about it. It's just simply something that I want to make sure is communicated. I don't like when you roll your eyes or I don't like when you make that statement or that whatever, that, that thing. I don't like that. And so you communicate that expectation and you ask for them not to do that. Okay. And then you also communicate your expectation. Hey, in the future, I'm going to make sure that I uphold that 
But also, please, I would like to make sure that we can't, when I'm stressed or when we're having a conversation, um, you know, that, that we are able to work it out and we don't run away from the conversation. But if something's really bothering you, please let me know so I can approach it and begin to work on it. This is the way healthy people communicate, making sure that we understand where we're coming from and how we communicate in an effective manner. So again, it's asking for expectations when appropriate. It's not always appropriate. And so I'll let you decipher what that is, but it's not always. Number four is now it's a changed behavior. It's a changed behavior. So to go back to that scenario, you, ha- you have an argument with your, your, your girlfriend, your, your significant other, your spouse, and, and you're stressed from work, and you uh, lash out at her in some unreasonable way. What you've done is you've owned the mistake. Hey, hon, I'm sorry. I acted like a fool last night. You apologize. I'm very sorry. Uh, and, and then you make amends if, poss- if possible. You can't really make amends in that situation. But then you uh, set the expectations. Hey, in the future, when I'm stressed about work, I'm going to compartmentalize that. I'm not going to bring that baggage here to the conversation. I may share it with you, but I'm not going to use you as the scapegoat for my stress. And what expectations do you have of me? And then hopefully she says, these are the expectations. You say, got it. I can do that. And now it's a matter of doing it. Now it's where the rubber meets the road. Can you actually do what you said you're going to do? Now, this is tricky because a lot of the times we have long-term relationships and you've built a pattern. You've conditioned the people in your life to believe that you're going to behave a certain way. So if you always lash out at your wife because you're stressed at work and you go through this process, you own the mistake, you apologize, you make amends, you ask for expectations, you you clarify what expectations she can have of you, she's probably not going to believe that you're going to change the behavior because you've gone through this bull crap before. You've done all this. Everything I'm sharing with you, you guys already know. And in fact, a lot of you are using it as a manipulation tactic. You do it and you say these things just so she'll feel better about your lack of showing up in an appropriate way for her. So when the rubber meets the road, which is now action, and you get stressed at work, and that's inevitable, and you come home and you're stressed out because of the project or a client or the deadline, and she's just trying to be there and be supportive and ask questions, and you go use her as a scapegoat, she's going to think that that's what you're going to revert to. So don't blame her for what you've conditioned her to believe about you. I hear that from a lot of guys. Well, my wife doesn't trust me. My boss doesn't believe in me. My kids don't love me. Why is that the case? Let's ask ourselves that. Why? Is it because we've conditioned them to believe that we're going to react a certain way? So this is not a game, guys. What I'm teaching you right now is not to game the system and to make people feel better about your lack of performance. It's actually changed behavior forever. So when you're stressed out at work, your response is, hey, hon, you know what? I know we got a lot going on. I know I told you I'd mow the lawn this afternoon and I will get to that. I'm very stressed at work right now. Uh, Missed a deadline and lost a big client today. I'm just going to take 10 quick minutes. Uh, I'm going to go take a shower real quick or I'm just going to go for a walk around the neighborhood, go check the mail, whatever, whatever your thing is, little outlet. And uh, I'll come back and I'll have a conversation with you. I'll go mow the lawn. I'll do what the things that we said we're going to do tonight. I just, I need 10 minutes. Now, again, she may not believe that, but if you take your 10 minutes, not 15, not 20, not two hours, but you take your 10 minutes and you come back with a level head, refreshed, ready to engage with her and your kids, ready to mow the lawn, be there for dinner, all the things that she said you do, she's going to start to believe that over time. It's not a one and done because I'll hear that often too. Well, I did everything you said, right? And she's still pissed at me. Well, yeah, you've been doing something else for 20 years and that's what she believes. In fact, she might even think, because I told you this is not manipulation. She might even believe that you're trying to manipulate her. She might even think, well, you're just listening to that, that podcast and that's the only reason you're doing this. She probably will believe that because it's so alien. It's so foreign to her. And the only way to help her see or your client see or your boss see or your kids or whoever you're trying to repair damage with is consistent, steady action over years and decades, just like you've done the poor actions over decades. 
All right, the next one. So we have own your mistakes, apologize, make amends. Uh, then we have number three, uh, ask and give expectations. Number four, change the behavior over the long haul. And then number five, check-ins. It's important to check in. But we're not doing this for validation reasons. And there's a, there's a really big distinction here. Because if you're validation seeking, it's going to come across as disingenuous. So let's say we'll go back to this scenario with your wife. So you can see like, this is common. I hear this a lot. This is why I'm talking about a lot. You get an argument with your wife. You do all the things I tell you to do. And then you go to her and you're like, hey, like, am I doing better? Like, how am I doing? Are you like, are you feeling better about this? Like, am I doing better at this? That's validation seeking. The motive of doing that is so you feel better about the way that you show up. And that's not really the motive that we want to have when we're doing check-ins. The motive is to check in with her about how she's feeling. So if your check-in is, hey, like, are we good? Like, is everything okay? Like, am I, how am I doing? Am, am I okay? Like, what do you think about this? Am I doing better at that? That's all self-centered. And I get into that. Because again, I'm, I'm an anxious attachment style. So when things don't always go my way, it's very easy for me to look at it as a personal indictment. And my head starts racing and I go to like jump to weird scenarios and situations that aren't there. That's just naturally what I do. I have to be very aware of that because I will fall into that. Guys, what I'm talking about here is just checking in like, hey, you know what, hon? The last couple of weeks, I've been very stressed at work. I'm sure you know. And I know a month ago, you know, we got into a, a pretty heated exchange about the way that I showed up when I was stressed. I would just like to check in with you in the midst of my stress. How, how have I been treating you? How have you been feeling about the way that I show up when I get home? How are the kids doing? Are they feeling better about our exchanges and engagement with each other? See the difference? Same types of questions, but now it's focused on the other person. How are you feeling? How are the kids doing? What have you noticed? It places the emphasis on them, which is what you want, because ultimately we as men do want to serve other people. We do want to lead our wives. We do want to lead our, lead our children. We do want to lead in our communities. That's what this podcast is all about. But in order to do that, you can't be desperate and say, help me, help me, help me. You fix me. Help me. Help me feel better about what's going on. No, that's not what we need to do. What we need to do is, how are you feeling about this? And maybe she'll give you some feedback. She, she might say, hey, you know what? You're 90% awesome. You do such a great job. I've noticed a huge improvement and we feel a whole lot better. Great, hon. Anything I can do, go back to the expectations. Anything I can do a little differently or anything I need to be aware of to make sure, because sometimes I don't always see it for myself. Anything I need to be aware of? No, you're great. Or she might say, yeah, you know, like sometimes when you get home, you disengage for an hour and you come back and you're always positive, but man, is there any way to have you home like right when you get here? And so maybe you can talk about what that would look like. So you go back to that managing expectations. So again, we're going to check in, but we're not validation seeking, which is self-centered. We're centered on the people we're communicating with. And then guys, the last thing here is your own personal after action review. And I've talked a lot about this. Uh, I, I do the after action review in just about every engagement, every encounter, every opportunity, every conversation, every podcast, every task. I do this for myself. And it's, a, it's simply five questions. Number one, what did I accomplish? Number two, what didn't I accomplish? Number three, what did I do well? Number four, what did I not do so well? And number five, what am I going to do moving forward? So if we're talking about this in the context of a, a friendship or a romantic relationship or a relationship with your kids, and you're asking how you handled that conversation, what did you get done? Well, I communicated to my children that I was stressed and that I needed a little time and space. Okay, good. You got that done. What didn't you get done? Well, I didn't put any deposits into the relationship bank account. They know that I'm stressed, but I yell at them. I was short with them and I didn't play baseball or uphold the commitments that I had made for that night with them. Okay. That's important to know. What did I do well? Well, in this case, um, I felt like, you know, I did a pretty good job explaining that I was busy with work, what I had going on, and that I need, you know, a week to be able to do this. But I wasn't as tactful as I would have liked to have been. Um, I wasn't as graceful in it. Uh, and I wasn't as empathetic to what they might be feeling as I'm having this conversation with them. 
Okay. And then the last question, what am I going to do moving forward? Well, tonight at the dinner table, because I didn't do such a good job earlier, I'm going to sit down and the first thing I'm going to do is say, hey, kids, as you know, I'm stressed at work. I lashed out at a few of you this afternoon and I wanted to say, I'm sorry about that. And I am going to work on that, right? We're going through the process. Uh, I'm going to do these things. What would be better if that you need to see from me. Again, now we're managing expectations. Now you're going to change the behavior. You're going to check in. You're basically going to do everything that I just went through as an element of your after action review. Now, I know if you're listening to this, we've been talking for who knows how long, maybe it's been, I don't know, 25 minutes or so. You might be thinking that's a lot. You know, you're talking about owning your mistakes, apologizing, making amends, asking for expectations, communicating expectations, changing the behavior for the long haul, checking in, but not validation seeking after action review. That's a lot. And I would suggest that if you're not used to this, it does seem like a lot. But I promise you, the better that you get at this, number one, you will need to do it less often because you don't want to do it. So you'll begin to change your behavior, right? That's point number four, changing your behavior which leads to less having to do this. That's the first point that I made. Like, Don't mess up in the first place because then you don't need to worry about any of this. But when we do, and we inevitably will, this is the process. But I'm telling you, it gets easier. Owning my mistakes is easier at age 42, almost 43 years old now than it's ever been in my life because I've been doing it. And I have been very, very consistent over the years and specifically over the past year and a half to two years. And it's easier. It, it's not a threat to me. Hey, I messed up. I screwed up. I, you guys hear me talk about it all the time. In fact, everything that I share with you is 99% a result of something I did earlier in the week that I need to figure out and be better at, including this. So I'm willing to admit my mistakes. I'm willing to go through this process. And it's easier than it's ever been because I've been doing it. And guys, the more you... In, implement the system, the more you begin to internalize it. And then it's not this tedious, monotonous, long drawn out process. It's just part of your everyday interaction with other people. Again, I'm going to close this out by saying what we led with, which is you can't necessarily repair the damage. But I believe that if you make enough, and I alluded to this earlier, deposits, positive, healthy, encouraging deposits into relationship bank accounts, it outweighs the negatives. If we're using that analogy, the bank analogy, if I take a deposit from my bank account, I don't ever get that money back. Now, sure, I could put more money in there, but I don't ever get that money out. If I pulled $10,000 out, I'll, I'll never have that $10,000 in there. And that's what we call lost opportunity cost. So this is a little bit of an economics lesson, but it applies to what we're talking about. If I take that $10,000 as a deposit from that bank account, I lose the $10,000 and whatever it would have earned. That's what we call lost opportunity cost. Even though I might in 30 days replace it with another $10,000, that's 30 days of growth that I'll never get back. It's the same thing in relationships. When you take a deposit out of a professional or personal relationship, you have lost opportunity cost in that relationship because it's going to do damage and it's going to set you back even if you make deposits down the road. And that's what I mean by you can't repair something that's already been done. But what you can do is you can offset it by making enough deposits into the relationship bank account. Finding creative ways to tell people you care about them. Showing up in positive ways. Leading effectively with class and grace and strength and initiative asking for people's feedback, taking into consideration how they feel about what it is you're doing. These are all deposits that you can make and hopefully should be making on a daily basis. And that way, when you mess up, and we will, and we take a deposit from that account because we will, we don't go into the negative because that's when problems start to take place. I'm talking about separations, divorces, losing a job, losing clients, getting passed over for the promotion. When that relationship bank account is at zero and you take one more deposit, it's done. 
So make sure you're always making those encouraging deposits into the relationship bank accounts. All right, guys, I hope that serves you. Uh, again, as a reminder, today we're open. Our exclusive brotherhood, the Iron Council, is open March 15th, 2024. So please enroll at orderaman.com slash Iron Council. We're going to get you started as soon as you sign up. You're going to get an email. You're going to get immediate access. And then you're going to work with uh, Jay Gerdulo and Alan Placer. Those guys are going to get you off. And I'll be there as well. But they're going to get you off on the right start and get you going as quickly as possible, up to speed, get all the information you need. And uh, you're going to be off to the races. So check it out. Orderaman.com slash Iron Council. All right, guys. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. We will be back. We'll be, excuse me. Let's try that again. We will be back on Tuesday of next week. Until then, go out there, take action, and become the man you are meant to be.